start off by thanking you resilient folks for hanging out all day. Uh, I'm Doug Dominich again. I spoke earlier, so uh, don't need to introduce myself again. The one thing I do want to say is um, we are starting breakfast tomorrow morning at 7.30 in the morning, again upstairs. We have Congressman Lamar Smith coming. He is the chairman of the House Science Committee, and he has been a superhero on the issue of the clean power plan and climate. So he will be a huge Something. treat. So please make an effort to be, excuse me, to be there. Because uh, it's all on, you know. you'll really enjoy it. Okay. And he's worth it. Um, so tonight what we're going to do is talk about this. There you go. The forthcoming book by Kathleen Hartnett White and Stephen Moore. And they're going to chat in the comfy chairs uh, with us for a little bit. And um, so uh, as a way of introduction, I and Kathleen's been introduced already once, but uh, Kathleen is the Distinguished Senior Fellow in Residence and Director of the Armstrong Center for Energy and the Environment here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, she uh, was appointed to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, that's Texas's DEQ, um, under Rick Perry and served under uh, Governor Bush uh, on the Texas Water Development Board and uh, she served actually as chairman of TCEQ. Uh, she's on the editorial board of the Journal of Regulatory Science, the Texas Emission Reduction Advisory Board, the Texas Water Foundation. Her articles have been published all over the place, National Review, uh, Investors Business Daily, uh, the Washington Examiner, Forbes, et cetera. And she's currently nearing completion of this very book that I'm talking about. So, um, so Kathleen, why don't you come forward, please, and. Take your place in the comfy chair number one. And then, um, yeah. Well, she's also a pretty good cook, too. Oh, is that right? <laughs> My husband. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And I think you own some dogs or something. I don't know what that's about. S Stephen Moore uh, is the chief economist for the Heritage Foundation, very well known national figure. Uh, founder and former president of the Club for Growth. Um, he's a contributor to the Wall Street Journal and uh, uh, is a daily Fox News economics commentator. He's the author of six books. His latest one is entitled, Who's the Fairest of Them All? And he's worked uh, for two presidential commissions and received the Ronald Reagan Great Communicator Award from the Republican Party. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Illinois where he was awarded the 2010 Alumni of the Year, Alumnus of the Year, I don't know which that is, and he holds an MA in Economics from George Mason University. Please welcome Stephen Moore. So I am now going to turn the podium over to Kathleen Hartnett White. And it's very comfortable in that chair, perhaps too comfortable. <laughs> At the end of this long day, I, so I decided to stand up, but um, Steve may very well want to. Um, we're just going to give you some highlights about the book and the range of the things it covers. Um, Steve and I kind of divided up focus. Um, I wrote um, a lot of the chapters about the, uh, the really very critical history to understanding um, the importance of energy and modern economic growth and the prodigious benefits it has conferred, conferred for human beings. And Steve has all kinds of wonderful uh, insights into the economics of energy and particularly the, the opportunities presented by the shale boom. But I'm going to go fast, and I'm probably even going to skip some slides because, um, again, after a day of many complex and sometimes very dreary um, issues as far as the, the, um, the potential impacts of climate policies, um, uh, what I have to offer to me is, to offer I think is extraordinarily positive. And a lot of this, well, the energy part and the environmental parts I've w dealt with for about 30 years, but it was only about two years ago was brought to my attention and it really reflected on how extraordinarily human life, the physical parameters of human life changed after 1800. That's not very long ago in history. And the greatest change was in this century, and the really greatest change was only since 1950. So we enjoy um, the affluence, the, the, all the ways in which um, energy amplifies our life um, in a way that um, only a couple generations have, 
and it's, it's somewhat at risk with these, these grand climate policies. Um, one way to talk about the topic of our book, different title, is The Great Energy Enrichment. Um, and I'd like to point out that it's not corn, that is a wheat field, and I, um, um, eth ethanol, um, I think, is one of the most counterproductively and morally offensive of, of uh, green policies. <laughs> but, and, and so here we go, here we go. I'm going to skip that one. That one takes explaining. There, the, I call this slide the great fact, and the great fact is the incredible trajectory that began around 1800 straight up, straight up. It represents, among other things, modern economic growth. You see the same hockey stick used by a variety of, of disciplines, but this same dramatic. It's from 0 AD to 2000 and some, but around 8 you had fairly static living conditions and you had and what is at stake with all these climate policies is that line going straight up. This is another way to look at it. Um, this, it me what it measures, and there are other speakers today that spoke about this, it, me it measures um, increased in, li in lifespan, increased in the global population, increased in real GDP per capita, that's that not an average income, but a real um, in income per capita, and um, the man-made emissions in fossil fuels, all tracking each other uh, very precisely. Um, what was amazing about this change, this revolution, was not just that there was a lot of economic growth, but for the first time in human history, an economic boom benefited the poor and the, and the average worker the most. It most changed their lives. They're all, for all history, there was always a small group of elites and then everybody else. Um, and before 1800, everybody else just served the small elite. Things started to change there, and en energy was one reason. Um, in, lifespan three times higher, income per capita, that's the really staggering one, 11 to 20. Some people say by 100 times, if you count in the quality of the service we gained, like, like cell phones, uh, like cars and on all of that, and the population of the world increased by eightfold, but there was more food available. Um, just another little slide to show you just what that means. This is just real income per person, but the, in, in England, um, and that, that same straight uh, trajectory. This just shows you very quickly uh, the, the increasing dependence on coal over about two or three centuries work. So by the time of the middle of the 19th century, it comes to massively dominate energy use. Um, and that vast economic growth that is astonishing um, to most ec economists. And a way of talking about some of the gains is in terms of living standard. People talk about U.S. Is, people have always envied this country for the, the, um, the magnitude of our living standard. Here's one way um, to describe it. In 1875, 74 percent of average income was just for food, water, clothing, shelter. Um, in 1995, only 13 percent was spent on the necessities of life, and, and the rest was discretionary income. Um, our book argues that fossil fuels was certainly not the cause of the Industrial Revolution but that it was one of several necessary conditions, meaning that without it, the, the amount of economic growth, the amount of industrial productivity would have been impossible, but also legal institutions which, which uh, upheld property rights and economic freedom, and in general, as we did in the 18th century, the inalienable rights of each human individual. Um, this, I think, is an interesting thing. It was implied by what many people said today, but energy consumption, if you measure energy consumption and gross world product, that the global version of gross domestic product, um, energy consumption and gross world product just dovetail each other. It's like a 95 percent correlation, which does su suggest, for in statistics, uh, causal-like conditions, but it, it grows in lockstep, and the volume of it is unbelievable. I think this no, I've been there. Am I going backwards? Yes, I changed. This shows you the kind of volume. These are in, I kind of like metric units better than um, the customary units uh, this country used, but look at the difference in 1850. That EJ is exajoule. That's just a measure of, of energy volume. In 1850, 2.5. In 1922, in 2000, 330 um, exajoules. 
And that this just shows you the magnitude of that kind of change. Um, this is something important to Steve and I, I think. Steve, the, uh, the economist, free market economist, Julian Simon, um, who said so many years ago, and Steve worked with him um, directly, um, he had these debates with Paul Ehrlich that claimed that the, o the world would be rapidly overpopulated, there would be global famine, um, because the, 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 the carrying capacity of the earth, a phrase you heard several times today, would be exceeded by the numbers, and, and, and Julian Simon had this famous bet with Paul Ehrlich, the, the, the author of The Population Bomb, and, and a real, um, as I like the word, misanthrope, regarded um, humanity with um, less concern than our Constitution does. But it, anyway, he, Paul, Julian Simon won all the bets the, the, on the basis of the price and, and the abundance of you know, various um, commodities or, or minerals. Um, but he, these words to me are very important and a way of, keen way of understanding energy. Energy is a master resource because it enables you to convert. It's not just another natural resource or another mer mineral. It enables you to, to transform all the, all the other materials. And in fact, it's a raw material itself. The entire petrochemical industries are best at the use of, of, of um, fossil fuels as a raw material. But the most important is the ultimate resource. And that is as the logic at the bottom of the bottomless well that I spoke about. That's human innovation, if in, in the context of freedom is allowed to um, operate. Whoops. Oh, my gosh. I turned it off. Oh, technical advisor. These look like good global warming type images. Do we just need to, what, <laughs> excuse me? Any hope? I could tell you a lot of really good dog jokes, but I'll spare you at this late hour. Oh, you'll catch up? Okay, great. Okay, and oh, I'm going backwards. Okay, okay, okay. I'm not going to read this when uh, Mark, I don't know whether Mark Mills is here, but when he was talking about the, the Google, um, uh, Bill Gates, and Bill Gates issues with renewables, this is a, um, a, a really profound statement of how, how impossible um, is the, the job of of using renewables to fulfill all electricity demand, and really the amount of materials that are used, uh, uh, just to, uh, instead of reading that, the amount of, um, of materials uh, a, a wind turbine, like about a three megawatt wind turbine, uses, for instance, in the amount of, of concrete and the amount of steel, is about three times um, what um, a natural gas or coal, in, in rough numbers, a natural gas or coal plant would use. It's in fact, renewables are not quite so green in many reasons, and it's not just the birds. You, you ought to see the amount of rebar that goes into the installation of one large, um, and the amount of concrete for the platform that has to hold a, a really massive use of materials. Um, and this wasn't talked about today, and just in, tonight's not the night because we need to move fast, but um, we really need the book goes into this in some detail. Look closely at what is occurring um, in Europe, particularly in Germany and the UK, as a result of a very aggressive pursuit of renewables. Uh, retail electric rates in Germany are for, the, for, for households, um, three times ours, three times higher, not 30 percent, three times higher. You can Google energy poverty journey, uh, Germany or Google uh, electricity as a luxury good Germany, and you get uh, data like 800,000 households can no longer afford electricity and they reverted to wood. You have a lot of industrial flight uh, from uh, very, very <coughs> um, uh, productive and, and long-standing German industries, some of which have come here because of the, our great natural gas. Um, the subsidies are, are, may reach a trillion by 2030. They're subsidizing coal plants to come back online. And they are use 30 percent, 39 percent of their, their renewables, about which they are so proud, is wood. Whoops, I, I keep wanting to go in the other direction. And just a few images of the glory of energy. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the amount of energy in 
the most uh, you know, effervescent there and gone in an average lightning bolt is unbelievable if we ever learn to harness that. Another one, I like the power plant down below, uh, that mighty, mighty lightning. Um, the sun burns enough hydrogen to meet energy man on the earth for um, 1,500 million years. So we're not, obviously not energy starved on this. And I'm not going to, um, just because I know we're, we're late, um, a, a lot of the book um, really tries to, as uh, this whole conference has, to really very carefully but articulate the, the, really the stakes and the scope of what's involved. Um, about 60 percent of the global food supply right now is attributed to the, the um, enrichment of fertilizer based on natural gas. This is not just, a, you know, transportation fuels and electricity and heat for manufacturing processes, but the, the, the extent of which fossil fuels um, amplify all kinds of things uh, necessary to human life. About 60 percent of, of materials are all made now by fossil fuels. I, I'm always interested that, that how we would replace either one of those um, in, in, in any way would be possible. And this is the most profound gift of energy, I think, time, time. If before the, if before the Industrial Revolution and, and, and the takeoff of modern economic growth, the overwhelming majority of the, of the population was extremely poor, uh, engaged in very, very arduous manual labor. There's no, there was no time for anything. With uh, and just look at in, in in terms of statistics, and these are from you, Steve. From the of course, Obama's been just to work for extra twenty hours. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we not only live three times longer, but the work. We can you imagine sixty six hours over six days a week? What would that mean? Is just is kind of time time to have. But with energy has come. This to me is the one that's really an, an almost spiritual benefit. The others are material or physical, important but physical. But when you have time, you have choice. Uh, when you have, unless you live under a tyrant, when you have choice, you can decide what you want to do. The human, all the uh, the human powers of creativity and um, can, can flourish, and. Um, <clears throat> That's a pretty special benefit. And this is my last slide. And I came across that picture um, before I wrote the paper that inspired the book. And I've never forgotten it, because that does not need to occur in this world anymore. We, we generate enough food, unless ethanol steals a critical mass of it, to feed all of the world's population with a lot left over. It, the malnutrition and starvation is a problem of access. We have conquered the food supply. And natural gas played a critical role in that. Um, this I'm, I'm borrowing, and I attributed it. This was from the title was from a, an editorial that Bjorn Lomborg had um, just within the last month. But I just thought the title was perfect: that that child does not need a solar panel. So I'll stop here tonight. I'm 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 more lively in the morning than in the evening. But um, I think there's an um, oh, to call it a moving story is 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 trivial. But I think. A part of the book really tries to document and tell this story because I don't think a lot of people have any, any, any idea that um, we are, our generation and the one before us, the first generation to get the full benefit of, of energy enrichment in our life, from our cell phones to our, our many cars and devices. And it's transformed the human condition. And that is at risk with these mindless climate policies. And uh, it's, it's just very important that we all uh, understand that further. So with that, Steve, you stay where you are or come up or what? Up. And then, you know, uh, we'd love to take some questions for you all. Um, thank you, Brooke, for inviting me. I, I always love coming to, uh, to Texas Public Policy Foundation, my favorite state think tank. Um, you know, you guys do an, an awesome job, and, and congratulations on the new building. I remember, I remember, I was here for the groundbreaking. So, um, you did, the, you built this about four times faster than it would if it was a government project. So, congratulations. <laughs> um, you know, I was just thinking when you showed that last uh, picture. Um, I was in. Um, how many of you have ever been to Africa? Um, most of you have. I had never been there. I went uh, last year. My niece was is in the um, Peace Corps, and she's in a small, very remote um, village in Tanzania. And, um, you know, so I spent a week there with her. And, you know, some of the happiest people I've ever met in my life, actually. Um, it, but 
Uh, wonderful people, actually. I fell in love with the people there. They were so kind and generous, that even though they have very little. But the thing that was so remarkable to me about that trip was, guess what they don't have? They don't have electricity. <laughs> they don't, I mean, they're living like it's the 16th century there because they don't have electricity. And, and so every morning these women get up and they have these big jugs and they put them on their head and they walk a mile down to the river and take the jug and put it on their head and, and bring it back and so on. And all of the necessities of life are so dependent. I mean, when, what you learn when you get there after is how vital electric power is to our lives. And it is something that um, people take um, you know, so for, uh, for granted, and I, you know, I, one of the things that got me interested in this project was you, when you wrote the paper, which is so superb on the this moral case for uh, fossil fuels, and, and there is a moral case for this, which is that if we don't have energy, how in the world can these rich Westerners tell these people in poor countries they shouldn't, you know, they're going to have, what, they're going to provide their electricity with windmills and solar power? It's, it's preposterous, really. And one of the points we make in the book is that um, this whole movement to limit energy, which is really what the whole climate change uh, derangement syndrome is all about, um, that really is a movement that is, uh, is going to be a highly regressive tax on poor people. The people who will clearly suffer the most from these policies of making energy more expensive, and that's what the climate change agenda really is about, it's how, how do you make energy more expensive and less accessible, the people who are going to be hurt by far the most are the people at the bottom. So the left loves to talk, I was just in Boston University uh, last night doing this big debate with 250 people against this liberal professor and he spent the first half of the debate talking about how horrible income inequality is and all these people at the bottom and the poor aren't making any progress in america and blah 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 and then he shifts to like you know and by the way we have to do something about global warming and we're going to have to have all these energy taxes and so i said professor what are you talking about i mean he didn't even get the joke you know first you talk about how much you care about poor people now you want to make energy more expensive for the people who who need it the most. And this is, by the way, I think a central contradiction of the argument of the left. They care about poor people, but they don't care so much that they're gonna make the vital necessities of life much more expensive for them. Um, I, the way I put it is Tom Steyer, you know Tom Steyer, he's the one who's funding all these left-wing things. If Tom Steyer's electricity prices go up by 40%, it doesn't make any difference to him. He doesn't care. I mean, he has plenty of money, but the people who do care, who, who people who are living, you know, paycheck to paycheck, and to have a 30 or 40 percent increase in their um, utility bills, it could be a 100 percent increase if we keep moving away from fossil fuels. That's a huge hardship on on uh, low-income people, and that's kind of one of the themes of our book, by the way, is that the people who are going to be hurt the most by these policies are uh, are the poor. Um, a second point, look, look, the big point that I dealt with in the book, and Kathleen is the energy expert, I'm an economist, but um, I've been thinking a lot about, I've been working a lot with the presidential candidates and so on, and the big issue is we don't have enough growth in this country. You know that. I mean, the economy has been growing under Obama at 2%, and that's just not enough growth to create the kind of high-paying jobs and the kinds of income gains that Americans would come to expect. And this is the reason Americans are so cranky right now. You know, the American public is cranky. They're angry. It's why you have the rise of Trumpism. People just aren't feeling the love for this recovery. Obama runs around, you know, does the icky shuffle in the end zone about how well things are going, and most people don't feel that way. 40% of Americans feel like we're, st they're, according to a series of polls over the last year, 40% of Americans today think we're Amer America is still in a recession. I mean, here we are, the sixth year of a recovery, and, and for 40%, they don't think there's been a recovery at all. Now, why is that? It's because there hasn't been enough growth. And so if you look at the average wages and salaries in this country, it's been 10 years now that Americans haven't had a pay raise. So they're cranky. And in fact, for a lot of these people, their real incomes have fallen. Inflation has been rising faster than their paychecks have been rising. And that's the fundamental problem that we're going to have to solve over the next few years. And one of the points that you know, I always make with my friends Larry Kudlow and Art Laffer and, and, uh, and Steve Forbes is, look, um, growth helps solve every problem. Whatever the problem is, the national debt, poverty, um, you know, climate change, whatever the problem is, if we grow faster, we have the resources to deal with this. And so 
We've been growing at 2%. We should be growing at 4%. The question then is how do we, and as you know, Jeb Bush and a lot of these other candidates are saying we can grow up 4%. I happen to think that they're right. We can. We could easily grow up 4%. In fact, I, if anything, I think they're being uh, you know, uh, too little ambitious. I think we could actually be growing at 5 or 6% because there's so much low-hanging fruit out there after s seven years of Obama of just not doing the real simple things that would increase growth. Well, it turns out that one of the areas where you could get a lot of additional growth almost instantaneously is through energy policy. And if we had a pro-America energy policy, we could increase growth by my calculations in the book by about 1.5 percentage points per year. Now that's a lot, that's huge. That's like $250 billion to $300 billion additional output per year. And how do we do that? Well, we produce our coal, we produce our oil, we produce our gas, and we go after it. And we have plenty of it. And we are, as we say in the book, we're the Saudi Arabia of, 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 of oil, um, of, uh, of natural gas, and of coal. And we ought to be using it for all the reasons that Mark Mills just talked about. So a couple of things that could be done immediately that would have a profound impact on growth. For example, one that would be very simple that President Obama should do immediately um, would be to just simply lift the ban on exporting oil and gas. I mean, this is craziness. There's no rational reason. This, you all know this, this law goes back to what, 1974 or 1975. It was during the OPEC, you know, um, era when, when we had the embargo. But here we are today, we're going to soon be producing, hopefully, we're going to be producing more than we, uh, than we consume. So we're going to need to export this stuff. And we've been look, talking to a lot of the experts in the field, people like you, sir, and, and they tell me that if we could lift that ban on exporting, um, that we could produce about $100 billion a year or more a year, starting next year. So $100 billion a year, that's a half a percentage point of GDP right there. So you go from 2 to 2.5%. Two, two then you do some other things. You start drilling on um, federal lands because we've been, you know, as you most of you know, 90% of the drilling that's been going on uh, over the last seven years with all the shale, oil, and gas, it's been on private lands. Well, guess what? There's a lot of this on public lands. And one of my favorite chapters in the book is the last chapter, which is about what if we started doing that? What if we actually had a president who just said, let's drill... Uh, on federal lands. Well, it turns out, uh, we talked to one of the world's experts uh, who worked at the Interior Department for many years. He, he has the whole inventory of, of what we've got. Well, we're sitting on, you know, we don't know the exact number, but in the tens of trillions of dollars of, of energy on public lands. And we estimate that if we just starting next year, and starting using existing technology, by the way, and the technology obviously always gets better year after year, using existing technology, if we were uh, to start to drill on federal lands, we estimate that for the federal government, this would be a windfill of about three to $4 trillion over the next uh, 20 years. That is to say, federal revenues would grow by three to $4 trillion. Well, you, you could do a lot of good with three to $4 trillion. And what we, we recommend um, in the book is that we split that money for three purposes. Number one, we use uh, some of it to finance the transition to tax reform so we can get a low rate flat tax. There are gonna be some transitional costs. So let's use these, these energy revenues to kind of fill the gap on that. Uh, second of all, you could start using up to about a third of the money for building the infrastructure that uh, people say we need to do, improve our roads and highways and pipelines and all of those things. Um, and number three, you could use the rest to um, retire our national debt. You know, let's, let's use some of this money to get our $20 trillion debt down. So there's, there's a huge potential there. I, I'll tell you kind of one funny story. I was giving a talk um, a couple months ago, and uh, I think it was in Dallas, maybe one or two of you might have been at this, at the um, Texas Oil and Gas Association meeting. And I started out my speech by saying, um, I want to congratulate you, you all people here. I said, you're the people who reelected Barack Obama. <laughs> and they didn't like that very much, right? Because they don't like Obama very much and Obama doesn't like them very much. But um, what I meant by that was that, and this is actually, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that without the shale oil and gas revolution that happened in the last seven years, there's no way that Barack Obama would have ever been reelected. It would, just wouldn't happen because the U.S. economy would have still been a recession. Almost on net, all of the growth that we saw in Barack Obama's first term was attributable to the shale oil and gas revolution. So um, this is, but as you said, Kathleen, this is just the start of something um, really big. 
Um, I want to make one other point, if I will, and then, then I'd love to take some questions um, from you all. What my favorite chapter in the book is the one that you wrote, which is about the Industrial Revolution. And, and I, learned, I learned a lot from, from reading Kathleen's chapters in the book. We've kind of been going back and forth, passing them uh, back and forth. But um, what's cool about that chapter, what I learned is, you know, you're exactly right. You show the chart of the, you know, the two big events that have, have changed the world were obviously the Industrial Revolution that happened in the late 18th century, and the other, uh, I believe, we're living in right now, which is the Digital Revolution. And these two things are having spectacular growth potentials for the world. And by the way, the drilling revolution that, going on, that is going on right now is a digital revolution technology. It's all, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you're doing it, but this is all technology that is due to, to uh, digital technologies. And so anyway, what's interesting, I think, and fascinating about Kathleen's chapter about the Industrial Revolution is that, you know, what we all learned in grade school was, you know, the Industrial Revolution is when modern machinery came into being and we started using automation to produce things. And so you had this huge spurt in output, um, you know, four to five times more productive than people were before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and um, what's, what's not told about that, and what I, what I didn't know, is what made the Industrial Revolution possible. And that was direct from wrong, fossil fuels. This, the re Industrial Revolution wasn't just a story of machinery, it was a story of energy. And what's interesting about that, and, and I was telling this professor, left-wing professor this last night, and he was grimacing when I was talking about this, but you know, he's saying, oh, we gotta use windmills and so on. Wait a minute, what changed in the late 18th century is people stopped using windmills, and they started <laughs> using, right? They stopped using windmills, and they started using coal and oil and gas. And they, why did they do that? Because oil and gas are a much, much better way to generate energy than windmills are. And so, you know, I said, you want to take us back to the Stone Age, because I think that's uh, a little bit about what this is all about. And I'm not a conspiratorialist, as um, Mark was talking about. I, I'm not a, but think about this, though. If you did want to destroy the industrial base of America, how would you go about doing it? Let's think as conspiratorialists. How would you go about doing it? You would destroy our energy supply. And that's the risk that we face. So we've got to get this book, you know, I, I want to get this all over, you know, the country. Yeah, I want to get into schools, I want high schools and grade schools, so people know this history and know what's at stake here. But so we get this right, we're going to see uh, a big boom. And I think Mark is exactly right. Um, and he says that I sort of steal his line, but if we get this right on energy, not only will the United States in the next six or seven years be energy independent, but I take this a step further and say we are going to be the energy dominant country in the world. And you know that's, that's what we want, not just for economic reasons, but national security reasons as well. So Kathleen, it's been fun working with you on this. I can't wait for the book to come out. And um, we're gonna just bar barnstorm around this country selling this message and thanks to TPPF for sponsoring it. So um, happy to take any questions. Yeah. Have a I'd like to make one comment too. If, if, am my mic still on so I can yeah, just speak? It is. Um, which I should have I should have should have thought of and I thought of it throughout all the presentations I heard today. What makes fossil fuels so special? I mean a megawatt's a megawatt of electricity. What and 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 why it ha played such a dynamic role in the beginning of indus industrialization and more importantly in the sustained growth from the you know the the initial burst is its energy content, as a matter of physics, is far denser than, um, than wind or solar. It's, it's what um, some physicists call power density, or engineers, I don't think really physicists, but the measurement of power is far superior. Power density, just for example, is, it, it's used as a measure in a variety of different ways, but it, it um, estimates the amount, really, of, of land or the surface area of the Earth um, um, consumed or occupied um, um, to generate the power. And the difference between, as many speakers spoke today, between wind and sun versus, the fossil fuels are stored in the ground. They're a store. As Jim, you and I were talking, renewables energy is a diffused flow um, that is unpredictable uh, and that humans can't control. Fossil fuels are energy dense, very concentrated, power dense, incredibly versatile, from clothing to fertilizer to pharmaceuticals to heart valves to asphalt. Thousands and thousands of materials are built of those. They're reliable. 
Mm -hmm. And most importantly, they can be controlled, controlled by human beings. So um, there's nothing inherently sacred about them, but they're, 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 the, the qualities um, inherent in fossil fuels make them an extraordinarily dynamic so, resource. You know, so one other quick point, you know, um, I am not- and then, we, then we want to get to some questions. Yeah, and I'm not necessarily, um, I'm not biased towards fossil fuels. I'm for whatever works, right? I'm an economist. And, you know, so you show me something that works, I'm for it. The problem with windmills, it doesn't work. It's just not a very smart way to get electricity. I was at a major energy conference. It was actually not an energy, a kind of futurist conference a few, a few um, months ago. And they had a, an energy expert up there, and he was talking about solar power. And, you know, it's ama the, the future for solar power looks amazingly promising. It's, it's 20 years away, 10, 10, 15, 20 years away. What? Or 40 years. You think that? Well, we don't. Anyway, we don't know. But you know, if we could harness the, the the power of the sun, you know, that would be a huge efficient way to get electricity. Windmills are incredibly inefficient. But the point is, let's take their best estimates and say, 20 years we can use solar as a major source of energy. Well, what are we going to do for the next 20 years? We're going to still need fossil fuels. And and, and I'm just one other thing. You know, I I think. There's a real future for nuclear power too. These micro, smaller nuclear power plants that could be a great way of generating electricity. So I think we as free market conservatives, Brooke, should be for whatever works, whatever's efficient, shut down the Department of Energy, right? Just shut the damn thing down and let the free market work in energy policy. So let's, uh, okay, we've got- sorry. I had to get that off my chest. <laughs> let's, uh, why don't we take a couple questions here because we do have one more thing we're gonna do after this. <laughs> okay. And uh, Dr. Beisner. I just wondered if one of you would address the, uh, the issue of, uh, of the provision of early energy, initial energy, uh, to places like sub-Saharan Africa, where grid is a long way away, um, and yet just how much real good can, can be brought in through, say, solar panels, something like that. How much of a real solution to the life-threatening problems of a place like sub-Saharan Africa? are uh, solar panels and wind versus uh, wanting to move toward a, a full-fledged grid of dispatchable uh, high-scale power? You know, it, it's hard to answer that question because if you're talking about, you know, what would work for the entire continent of Africa, you know, versus, um, but from, from what I have um, I've read from, from many sources, um, the, the extent to which, like, because we, I'd like to say, so. Renewables are fine, but let's not subsidize them. Let them find their niche. A again, there's not anything inherently wrong. Um, but that the the solar panels uh, have been not worked at all successfully. But maybe, be but I maybe because of the limited way in which they've been used. And I just know that um, <clears throat> those really involved in it. <clears throat> I don't know how to address the grid problem, but that um, if you look at the um, early electrification of, or the final electric, electrification of all kinds of rural area in this country, you had uh, kind of limited um, transmission systems instead of, um, um, you know, central grids that worked for, for, not for areas of large population density, but, but for that. Um, and electricity in the form in which it, it you know, it is transmitted and then with switches in your house is so, so, so much more versatile and useful um, than solar. But I don't so know whether that answers your question. So we had a question right here. Yeah, um, one of the things that it hasn't been mentioned and you kind of hinted at was that this whole green revolution wants to scrap an entire industry um, and all the technology with it um, and throw it away. Um, years, decades, from its, its, its end of life. And um, you kind of hinted at that. Um, would you address that a little bit? Um, you know, because um, the waste is incredible. It's funny you should bring this up because uh, you know, I've been thinking about this debate last night that I had against this liberal professor. And you know, he was starkly honest about what he wants. And he, he basically said, we're gonna have a radical transformation of our economy. You know, and we're gonna put every oil and gas company out of business, and, and that's the only way to do this. We have to save the planet. I mean, these are, these are zealots. This is a religious zealot movement. And, you know, 
to hell with the, they're Stalinists, actually, what they are. They're not really, I mean, they're Stalinists. They're people who want to control the whole economy. And, and you know, what I was saying, I'm for what works, they're for what doesn't work. Right? If it doesn't work, they're for it. So, I mean, the, the whole story of natural gas, which you all know, is, you know, the left was all in favor of natural gas until we had shale oil and gas, and then they were against it because it was cheap and plentiful. Um, so I do think there's a, a larger, you know, there's a larger agenda here than climate change. I think it's about, I don't know if it's a guilt complex that we have. By the way, the, the other point, I mean, how many of you, you've probably seen this, but you know, here they're going to, starting next week or something, they have this big Paris, um, you know, climate change uh, thing. And the um, Department of Energy just reported that next year, China and India, and India alone are going to build 500 new coal plants. 500. They're not reducing their carbon emissions. They're not. So what we've got in the United States is basically unilateral economic disarmament. In other words, we're, for every coal plant we shut down, they're going to build 10. How is that going to reduce global warming? And, and by the way, they estimate that in the next decade, there'll be another 1,000 coal plants. So even if we reduced, you know, even if we produce no coal in this country, the emissions from coal are going to continue to go up. My own feeling is, look, if you really believe, you have to have an incredible faith in government to think a government that can't balance the budget, that can't run a single program, right? That can't even run a computer program for the healthcare, you know, can't even get the website to work. But they're gonna change the way the temperature of the world? I mean, it's, it's this kind of grandiose um, utopian vision that we need to attack. And, and let me just say this, I know we're, we have to move on, but, and you're gonna hear about climate change. I, I said this at the last conference, I'm gonna spank you guys a little bit again. Your industry does a terrible job defending yourselves. You know, you just do. You, as you said, this is the master resource. Everything we have is a result of energy, what you do, and you can't sell it to people. And, and you better, because you're under assault. And what you do is really the foundation for the modern life that we have. And let's do that. Let's find a way, and maybe our book can be a little part of that. But we, these guys are coming right at your throats. Right so, at your throat. So speaking of the book, when is it going to be out? February. April? February 22nd. I, I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> that's <laughs> a, no, 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 that's <laughs> not. I think April. No, no well, that, that's the publisher's. Uh, okay. That's the well, publisher's published day. <laughs> and, but anyway, I hope, you know, they're, gr they're great stocking stuffers for 2016 and uh, stimulate the economy and go out and buy them. And, you want to uh, want to make a bet right here in front of me? <laughs> I bet so. you it'll be April and she's going to bet. February 22nd. You got it. Wait a minute, what do we bet on? <laughs> anyway, thank you, Brooke, for bringing me out again. I'll see you all in the morning. And, uh, Kindle edition. Come on, so, great. So, any last, oh, is that it? Yeah. Okay, you have one last question. This is it. Uh, talking from the oil industry standpoint, uh, let me first tell you that uh, the future looks extremely bright. Uh, the cooperation between all the oil companies now is intense. So, we're getting fast development technology in order to, and how to drill these horizontal wells and how to do this new frack treatment right and um, every time something does somebody does something new the service companies pick it up and transfer it to all the rest of them there yes. are no patents there's yep. nothing no withholding of it, any information uh, we now have gotten to the point that we have maybe as many as a hundred thousand Tremendous amount right. uh, uh, here in all the three major basins, you know, the, the Wolfbury and the, and the Permian Basin, and the, uh, but uh, the Eagle Theater and the Bakken. Right. Uh, but um, uh, it's just that, uh, so the future looks extremely bright. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, why haven't we done a better mm -hmm. job? Uh, yeah. And the, the main uh, reason is we, one of the probably the main thing is we don't know how to get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let, let me just, you know, I gave yeah. a talk before another group that said, uh, uh, I said, okay, you got the problems of, uh, uh, of the oil price coming down, and then you've got the problems of the federal government, the EPA. Yeah. I said, 
DPA is far by far the largest. Of course. Part, and you better be start thinking about that. Right. And of course, DPA is now, like you said, is really going to uh, hurt us again. So uh, we realize it's there, and we just don't know how to tackle it. But we're learning how to tackle it. Okay. And, and uh, Texas public policy is one of the main ways we can attack it. So. so <laughs> well, you know, Barack Obama said uh, when he announced that he wasn't going to build the Keystone Pipeline. I mean, that's another thing we need to do is build pipelines in this country, obviously. And, you know, he made this stunning statement. He said, I'm sorry, we're just going to have to keep this stuff in the ground. We're sitting on a $10 trillion buried treasure. I mean, can you imagine Saudi Arabia 40 years ago saying, yeah, we've got, you know, more oil than everybody else and we're not going to use it. But every, just one statistic to leave you with that's, that's in the book that just, I'd love to see your industry promoting this. Every time the, the price of gasoline at the pump drops by one penny, one penny, that puts a billion dollars more money into the hands of American consumers that they can buy on other things. You know, going to McDonald's or going to the restaurant, that makes a big difference. Just show ads at the people at the gas station. How do you like $1.89 gasoline? They love it, you know? Well, guess what? Barack Obama wants to take it back to three eighty nine dollars a gallon. That kind of thing would be such an effective way to, to promote which is, what is the fundamental industry in America that is, that is propelling all the growth that we have, so. Please thank our authors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs>